The objective of this session is to discuss the relevance of open budgets to building healthy and resilient public institutions and societies in the COVID-19 context in order to support the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. The COVID-19 pandemic and the related health, social and economic crisis highlight the need to accelerate the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, but will also significantly affect our efforts to implement the SDGs. The economic slowdown related to the pandemic will affect the mobilization of revenues and increase expenditures, especially in sectors like health or social protection. This will exacerbate the financial needs for SDG implementation, but also stress the importance of spending better the resources that are available. Learning from the 2008 financial crisis, many governments have acted swiftly but countries will need to maximize and to create fiscal space to fund adequate COVID-19 response and recovery measures and to support SDG implementation. In addition, the vast uh, amounts of resources involved, the increased risks of emergency expenditures, the uncertainty about the time horizon and the implications of the crisis, the technicalities of government responses, and the intricacies of public finance, among other factors, affect public perceptions about government responses. In this context, as highlighted uh, during the SDG moment last week, transparency, participation, and accountability need to be at the center of how we move forward. This is essential to building trust in public institutions and to ensuring that they deliver results that support the implementation of the SDGs. It is important to accelerate action to increase transparency and equal participation in the budget process, establish transparent public procurement frameworks, and strengthen national oversight mechanisms, such as supreme audit institutions, to assess budget performance. As noted in the World Public Sector Report last year and the Financing for Development Report this year, it is critical to integrate commitments to the SDGs in budgetary and fiscal processes at the national and subnational levels, and to adopt practices to monitor and report on the mobilization, allocation, and use of public resources in support of the goals. Civil society, through analysis, evidence-based recommendations, advocacy, and oversight, can contribute to strengthen public financial management and support greater revenue mobilization and optimal spending. Technology can also help. The challenges are significant. However, there are examples of good performers and strong practices in all regions of the world. Leveraging these experiences can provide alternatives and a way forward for different stakeholders to identify and advance actions that can help strengthen openness of fiscal and budget processes to support the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. To discuss these issues, I would like to welcome our speakers to this session. Elena Mondo, Senior Technical Advisor of the Open Budget Initiative at, at the International Budget Partnership. Jesus Rodriguez, Auditor General and President of the General Audit Office of Argentina. Kenneth Mugambe, Budget Director at the Ministry of Finance planning and economic development in Uganda. Mary Afan, national president of the small scale women farmers organization in Nigeria. Katarina Ott, senior research advisor at the Institute of Public Finance in Croatia, a member of the committee of experts on public administration. And Oliver Swank, senior economist at the Financing for Sustainable Development Office at UNDESA. Welcome and thank you for invite, uh, accepting this invitation to participate in the, in the virtual discussion. So I would like to start uh, with uh, Elena asking you um, to share with us some of the highlights of the Open Budget Survey 2019. Uh, the survey is available at the website of the International Budget Partnership and we will also post the link in the chat for those uh, that are interested. What are the trends? What are the main findings of the Open Budget Survey? And how can we interpret these findings in the context uh, of uh, COVID-19? Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you. I just had to find the unmute button. 
Uh, and let me also just uh, open up the presentation. Thank you, Arancia. Um, it is a pleasure to be here virtually with all of you, at least. Um, and in my presentation, I will really um, give you a very brief overview of the key findings of the most recent edition of the Open Budget Survey, yes, 2019, that was um, published earlier this year. And then I'll really just try and, and set the stage for, for the panelists' interventions later on by really trying to make the COVID connection. Um, uh, that is, how can we advance open budgeting during time like these, times like these? Um, and really, how can we make this crisis an opportunity to do better, to progress, and to further um, support the implementation of the 2030 agenda? So, um, why are open budgets central to responding to the COVID-19 emergency? I guess I would start by saying that budgets are key at any given time, budgets are key to the actual implementation of a government stated policies. Um, so budgets without, you know, policies without budgets are, um, are, are just words. They're not, you know, ventilation uh, um, equipments, they're not unemployment support, they're not, you know, laptops for children that at the moment can't attend school in person and only virtually. So budgets are essential, right? And governments have been responding to the COVID crisis, uh, both the health and, and the social and economic consequences of the crisis through unprecedented fiscal policies and decisions. And this is great. This is, uh, this is what it's supposed to be done. Um, but I would say two things. One is that speed might not be always the um, accountability's best friend. And so it's important that accountability is, um, in, is maintained, even if these decisions have to be taken in a, in a fairly uh, quick um, pace. And, and second is that we've seen how COVID has actually magnified um, pre-existing differences in economic and social conditions. So we have seen how it has disproportionately disrupted the livelihoods of those that are at the lower end of the income scale, those who cannot have uh, the possibility to self-isolate, those who have less job security and are more exposed to possible contagion and, and possibly less access to healthcare um, um, services. And so the case for open budget that we've been making for the last over 20 years um, um, is even more relevant, especially during times like this, especially during a crisis. Open budgets are critical to support more efficient resource allocation, uh, improve service delivery, earn public trust, and leave no one behind. And, and it was in this spirit that over 15 years ago, the Open Budget Survey, OBS for short, was um, created. Um, the, the Open Budget Survey is really a research, but also an advocacy tool, which is based um, on, on an assessment that is evidence-based of three uh, pillars of accountability. The first is transparency, which is um, how public resources, so public information, information being uh, shared with the public on how the resources are spent and raised. The second pillar is whether there are opportunities for um, citizens and the public more generally to participate in budget policy decisions. And the third is um, oversight by independent um, um, legislatures as well as supreme audit institutions. The Open Budget Survey is based on a questionnaire that is completed in each country by an independent budget expert and is reviewed by an anonymous, also independent expert. And in 94 of the 117 survey countries in the 90, 2019 round, um, also a representative of the Ministry of Finance has, had the, um, has given input in, into the questionnaire. So it's also a dialogue and it's the beginning of a dialogue to promote reform in, 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 in these countries. Um, just one small methodological note is that uh, to maintain consistency um, of methodology across countries, we have used information that has been collected and events that took place through the 31st of December, 2018. And so we will, of course, um, update all this information in 2021 Open Budget Survey that is uh, going to start um, in the coming months. I will give three findings, one for each of the pillars that I just highlighted, uh, but in the, in the interest of time, but um, you should feel free to um, consult our website to see more and also country-specific results that might be uh, of interest. The first 
finding is um, related to budget transparency. Uh, and here, you know, this map is hopefully self-explanatory. You'll see that green is good, dark green is very good, uh, red not so good. Um, and 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 you'll see if you look at the at the dark green countries, the the countries highlighted in dark green, that um, there is a a very big variation in, in characteristics of the countries that are best performers in the 2019 survey. Um, and this is good news. This means that um, being um, um, advanced in being transparent, in, in being open, is not specific to any particular set of characteristics. We have countries such as Mexico, South Africa, Georgia, New Zealand, Sweden, that are all performing above 80 in the open budget survey. Um, in the transparency um, um, section of the Open Budget Survey. Second finding that I will highlight here is that uh, the state of budget transparency is still, still has room for improvement. So you'll see that the global average is 45 out of 100. However, we have uh, seen progress through the rounds of the survey. And, and also in the 2019 survey, we've seen that the global average has finally turned to, 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 to positive in the sense that in 2017, we've have seen a, a drop in transparency, in global transparency overall, compared to the previous round of the survey. But we've seen that now the trend has finally picked up again. So the, the positive trend has picked up again. And so um, we're already, we're back to the uh, right trajectory, I would say. Second finding that I'd like to highlight is uh, in relation to the participation opportunities throughout the budget process that are offered uh, by various institutions in various countries. Um, and so by public participation, I should, I should mention, um, we measure the possibility, the opportunities provided by, by institutions involved in the budget process, namely the executive, the legislatures, and the supreme audit institutions, um, opportunities provided by these institutions to citizens and organizations to take part in their decision-making processes that are related to the budget. And from this, <clears throat> excuse me, from this graph, you will see that participation opportunities are still very limited. So the global average, as you'll see, is only a, a, a mere 14 of, out of 100. A, and opportunities for participation are more common during the formulation and the approval stages of the budget process. And then um, I guess the third finding, which, which, which I would like to highlight is that, yes, the global average is very low, but we have been able to highlight very interesting and promising cases around the world of countries that are doing, um, um, pro providing innovative ways to in engage citizens in their um, budgeting processes. And finally, um, third pillar and third finding, which is related to um, oversight. And you'll see from this graph that there are still few countries that provide adequate levels of oversight from both legislative and audit institutions. And so ideally, we'd like all these little dots to be in the top right um, quadrant of this graph, um, while they're still a little bit too much on the left for, for, for the time being. Um, and of course, why is this important? This is, this is important because uh, gaps in oversight weaken the checks and balances in the overall accountability system. And so um, adequate oversight is essential to ensure accountability, as well as the other two pillars that I just mentioned, transparency and participation. But um, what I also would like to highlight now is the fact that um, the open budget survey results or uh, the open budget survey was conducted prior to the COVID crisis hitting the, the world. And the results were released as the crisis was, was hitting uh, in April uh, 2020. And so we are mindful and we realize that governments and, 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 and citizens have to face, have had to face unprecedented situations and decisions. Um, but we're also able to see that um, many opportunities for opening budgets during this time. Um, and I would highlight, I guess, four of these opportunities. Um, um, the first being that there is international consensus on the need for transparency and oversight, but there's also been support provided to, to, to ensure that even during these times, um, transparency and oversight are um, um, provided. And so, for example, GIFT, the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency, which is a network of um, multilaterals, um, governments, and civil society organizations that have uh, come together to provide support on fiscal openness have, uh, for example, drafted recently drafted a guide 
to support governments uh, to ensure fiscal openings in their emergency responses. And they're also providing um, trainings and, and other resources um, to, 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 to support this agenda. And then I think uh, the IMF uh, um, famous statement of do whatever it takes, but keep the receipts also kind of made the news um, a, a while ago. And, and I think what we added as IBP was, well, keep the receipts and publish the receipts in the sense that it's very important to keep accountability, internal accountability, but also external accountability. So I think there is consensus around this. Secondly, we have observed that governments across the world have expanded the use of real-time budget portals that had already been set up to disclose COVID-related spending. Um, this, this slide is just showing a few examples um, from South Africa, Brazil, Philippines, as well as um, the European Union that is um, in this particular case publishing all the COVID-19 related tenders. Um, and, and really th this is um, also speaking to the use of technology and, and, and expanding this use of technology to, um, to, to disclose disaggregated budget information that is so crucial uh, for monitoring at this stage. Thirdly, and, and I guess to complement this as well, we have seen um, that civil society has um, engaged, strongly engaged in, in monitoring the government response to, to the COVID emergency uh, by um, using the data, by publishing data, by tracking service delivery, by tracking the COVID response as well. And we've seen here again here, there's again only a select sample uh, from uh, Nigeria, um, from Colombia, uh, from the Philippines and from South Africa. Um, and, and the idea is, is really to, uh, to be able to not just monitor the government response um, for mm -hmm. an accountability purposes, but also to potentially support governments in their response, making sure that 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 um, information is shared in terms of whether services are uh, reaching those who really need um, those services, and and the policies and the response is effective as effective as it, sh as it should be. And then finally, and I guess we'll, we'll hear more about this. Um, again, we've said that auditing is an essential element of accountability, and and so it's very important. Um, and, and, and challenging, I guess, but also very important for the audit institutions to, um, to start um, and auditing and, and, and monitoring these measures as soon as possible. Um, and, and where possible, um, collaborate with civil society um, in this. Um, we have, and I think we, we can potentially talk about this later, um, a, a, a pilot project that is meant to strengthen audit accountability with the collaboration between civil society and audit institutions in a number of countries. And we really strongly believe that citizens can help both um, in guiding in a way where audits can, can take place or, or should take place based on, 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 on what's observed on the ground, as well as provide um, the eyes on the ground. And so as an audit investigation takes place, citizens can uh, can provide evidence and, and, and data to support those audits. So where does this leave us? Um, I, I mentioned a, a few slides ago that progress in opening budgets is possible. We've seen it through the years, through the various rounds of the open budget survey. And, and, and we know that it is even more necessary in these times. Um, now, what we have observed through the different open budget survey rounds is that Progress is possible and it has happened, but it's been very slow or it's been too slow. And so IBP and its partners have come together and have uh, created a call to action to open budgets. And so we are calling on all governments and stakeholders to unite around a common agenda um, that revolves around four um, points. So we call on all governments to do four things. One, to publish information on how public resources are generated, allocated and spent, and to do this in a timely manner that is accessible to all. And the open budget survey can be a, a, a reference for, for, for what that means. The second is, that, um, is to create opportunities for all people, particularly those that are coming from marginalized communities to provide input into the budget process. The third is to strengthen monitoring and oversight of budget execution. Uh, and, and this is again, particularly important uh, in, these, in these times, uh, you know, we've seen how in the last few months, 
um, budgets had, had to be shifted, um, additional funds had to be sought and, and spent. And so the, the budgets as they were approved had, um, had to be changed, which, which was obvious because an emergency had to, be, had to be dealt with. But then it is even more important than to monitor these changes and, 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 and keep um, oversight on, on these decisions. And then finally, we call on all governments to sustain and institutionalize these improvements in open budgeting. Um, so this can protect um, improvements and progress from political shifts. So um, again, the, the, I'd like to end with, with, with an invitation to, to join us in, in, these, in, the, in this call to action. Uh, um, and, uh, and please uh, feel, uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely welcome any questions that you may have uh, on this and, and other parts of my presentation. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Elena. Um, our next, next speaker will um, speak in Spanish. So those uh, of you who need a simultaneous interpretation, please uh, use that option. Um, me gustaría invitar ahora a Jesús, eh, por favor, eh, para que compartas un poco tu perspectiva en términos de cuáles son los desafíos en, en América Latina, eh, en términos de transparencia presupuestaria, eh, control presupuestario en el contexto de eh, la pandemia del coronavirus que estamos, que estamos viviendo, cuáles son los desafíos de gobernanza eh, y lo que supone también desde el punto de vista del control. Adelante, Jesús. Muchas gracias, Aran. Muchas gracias por la invitación a ser parte de este encuentro que aborda un tema decisivo porque estoy seguro y convencido que para cada uno de nuestros países eh, la manera de procesar los desafíos y las consecuencias del COVID y la pandemia será resultado de cómo evoluciona la economía global, qué comportamiento tengan los organismos multilaterales, pero también, muy especialmente, de la aptitud de nuestros sistemas políticos para afrontar los desafíos de esa gobernanza. Yo voy a tratar de hacer primero una, traer al, a la reunión algunos indicadores del impacto que el COVID ha provocado y luego sí tratar de, de señalar los desafíos de la gobernanza en nuestra región de América Latina. Al día de hoy tenemos casi un millón de víctimas que lamentar y casi 32 millones de afectados en el mundo por la pandemia. Podemos discutir de muchas cosas, de cómo quedará la distribución del poder global, qué pasará con la disputa estratégica entre las superpotencias y seguramente habrá más de una opinión. Pero de lo que no hay dos opiniones es que estamos frente a la crisis más dramática en términos de su profundidad y de su dimensión en el último siglo. Déjenme darles algunos números para iluminar esta afirmación. Según la OIT, las horas perdidas en el segundo trimestre de este año equivalen a 300 millones de puestos de trabajo de tiempo completo. Según el Banco Mundial, 100 millones de personas más van a caer en la pobreza extrema. Según el Índice de Desarrollo Humano, que lleva tres décadas, será la primera vez que tendremos un retroceso. Y la CEPAL, nuestro organismo dependiente de Naciones Unidas en la región, estima que más de dos millones y medio de empresas van a desaparecer, que el Producto Bruto Interno caerá el 10% y que se incrementará el contingente de pobres en 45 millones de personas llegando a más de 220 millones de personas bajo la línea de pobreza. Las respuestas de los gobiernos fueron, como fue señalado, rápidas, importantes. Según un reciente estudio del Fondo Monetario Internacional sobre 55 países, el promedio en relación al producto de la suma del gasto presupuestario y las ayudas financieras es en promedio el 10% del Producto Bruto Interno. <ríe> Repito, gasto presupuestario más ayudas financieras. Pero como siempre los promedios eh, esconden diferencias importantes. Entre el país que menos de asignó y el país que más asignó, la diferencia es de 1 a 100. 
el menor 0,4% del producto y el más destinó esfuerzo fiscal y monetario, 40% del producto y este último fue Alemania. Para nuestra región de América Latina, ese promedio de los siete países que han podido ser identificados es del 8% del Producto Bruto. Ahora bien, nuestra región afronta los desafíos de la pandemia en un contexto particular y que merece ser tocado. Los que no venimos de las ciencias médicas aprendimos una palabra en estos días, que fue la comorbilidad. Bueno, nuestra región de América Latina tiene comorbilidades. La primera, estamos en una región que tiene eh, sistemas políticos democráticos más o menos recientes, pero en general de baja intensidad. Además, nuestra región es la más violenta del mundo. Eh, con el 9% de la población tiene un tercio de los homicidios dolosos que se cometen en el mundo. Además es la más desigual. De los 20 países más desiguales del mundo, 8 están en América Latina. Y finalmente, el retroceso en las capacidades para combatir la corrupción. Entonces, en este contexto, eh, la preocupación es grande y tal es así que importantes líderes de nuestra región de expresidentes, pensadores, académicos, relevantes eh, figuras públicas, llamaron la atención sobre el riesgo de soluciones, entre comillas, populistas y autoritarias. Entonces, nuestro papel de las EFS, ¿por qué es relevante? Es relevante porque está demostrado que existe una asociación positiva, una relación de causalidad directa, entre la fortaleza de las instituciones y el resultado económico y social. Eh, hay evidencia empírica que lo muestra. Hay opiniones en contrarias también, pero para los que piensan que importan poco las instituciones, yo los invito a que miren, por ejemplo, Centroamérica y que piensen cómo es posible que en la misma región, con la misma cultura, los mismos antecedentes, la misma historia, haya países que tengan tan distinta diferencia en resultados económicos y sociales. Y en nuestra región de la América del Sur, el Río de la Plata también ofrece ejemplos muy notables. El sistema institucional que rige en la América Latina, el presidencialismo, trae consigo la noción de equilibrio entre los poderes, controles y contrapesos. Y en ese sentido, la rendición de cuentas horizontal es imprescindible. Pero no alcanza con eso. Tiene que haber también rendición de cuentas vertical. Y aquí las organizaciones de la sociedad civil y los medios de comunicación independientes juegan un papel decisivo. El ODS nuevo, número 16 plantea este tema de manera extraordinaria y me parece muy relevante traerlo a la mesa. Y termino complementando lo que señalaba Elena de los pronunciamientos de distintos organismos en relación a este tema. La Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, la semana pasada, señaló que eh, es imprescindible para garantizar el goce y ejercicio de los derechos humanos que los gobiernos fortalezcan los mecanismos de rendición de cuentas, porque está verificada la falta de criterios claros para rendir las cuentas sobre los gastos realizados. Entonces, los derechos humanos también son una causa que explica la necesidad de la rendición de cuentas en nuestros países. Si hay alguna pregunta posterior, puedo dar cuenta de algunos iniciativas interesantes que en este sentido hubo en las entidades fiscalizadoras superiores de la región e incluso el del propio caso de nuestra Auditoría General de la Nación. Muchas gracias. Gracias eh, Jesús. Estoy, estoy segura que habrá interés por conocer algunos de esos ejemplos concretos y de las iniciativas de la GEN. Um, cambio ahora a inglés. I will turn to English uh, again. So I would like to invite now 
um, Kenneth uh, Mugambe uh, from Uganda to share uh, his perspective on uh, budget transparency and accountability in Uganda. What are the achievements? What are the challenges? And what is the situation in the current context? Uh, Kenneth? Please unmute uh, your microphone. Kenneth, can you hear me? Yes, please go Yes, ahead. I can hear you now. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, unfortunately, at the beginning, my connection was a bit intermittent and I actually sent you a message. I hope you saw my message. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? I, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, now Uganda, Uganda, of course, as you know, is located in the eastern part of uh, Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. I must say we've been a little bit uh, lucky, uh, more or less like uh, most of the countries in the Sub-Saharan Africa region. We have not had uh, uh, a huge number of cases, you know, like we've seen uh, of COVID, like we've seen uh, in Europe, in the US, in Latin America. Uh, uh, as of today, uh, I think we have about uh, the mortality is still low and also the rate of infection, uh, just over 60, you know, death and uh, maybe uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, 10,000 infections, uh, which we are seeing. But that aside, uh, the government, uh, right from the beginning, uh, uh, implemented a very uh, critical uh, lockdown measures, uh, which we believe actually had it uh, in terms of uh, uh, minimizing the infection rate. But of course, uh, there's also a challenge, the fact that uh, uh, the slowness in testing, so you can't actually tell the exact number of people. And of course, by the nature of our population, uh, uh, which is largely, you know, rural best, of course, so there's a, a big, big change in the dynamics of the population with a, a lot of, uh, you know, movement towards the urban areas. So there's that challenge, of course. So we cannot actually, you know, celebrate that the infection rate is that low. When actually we are not testing much. Now we, uh, we, we in terms of uh, 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 increasing uh, the transparency of the budget, I think we are among uh, uh, the first countries. We were among the first countries actually uh, to undertake deliberate strategies of opening up our budget. Uh, we've done this uh, for over a decade. Uh, we actually had uh, a very clear strategy uh, for budget transparency. Uh, for over, you know, over almost 10 years, uh, as I said, almost 10 years ago, uh, with a very clear uh, system that allows the population to access budget information. We established a dedicated budget website, which has a lot of information, right from the basic budget information uh, to the details, practically up to one of the, uh, up to the lowest level, in our administrative system at the sub county. So, county is like a second tier level, wrote down, you know, in the local government. So, you have all the information, including the work plans, the allocation of resources for the basic services that the population accesses. Hello. To the extent that uh, any person, at least somebody who, who has access to the internet, Hello, I hope you can hear me. Uh, to the extent, I was saying that to the extent that uh, uh, anybody who has access to the internet Hello. can actually log into our web budget website and be able to access information on the budget for whatever service, uh, including all the allocations, where it is the expenditure <coughs> and also uh, the revenues. Now, the COVID pandemic. Uh, of course, has uh, created a lot of uh, it's like there's no connection. Uh, a lot of challenges, uh, you know, for a small economy like ours. Uh, the economy itself, of course, has slowed down. Uh, the economy has uh, itself slowed down. Our revenues, you know, have gone down, and of course, because of the domestic revenue going down, uh, we have had to increase our fiscal deficit. Uh, we have had to increase our fiscal deficit. Uh, can you hear me? Kenneth, we, we can hear you. Can you hear, you can hear me? 
Yes, we we can hear you. Please uh, go ahead. I will let you know if we have problems. Okay. Please. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, 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 great. So I was just pointing out some of the challenges we have encountered. As I said, the, the economy obviously has slowed down. Uh, for the last couple of years, we have been growing at over 6%. Uh, last year, on account of COVID, uh, in the second half of the financial year, largely because of COVID, we grew by 3%. Uh, the revenues have gone down, as I said. And of course, because of that, we have had to resort to external borrowing uh, to the extent that uh, our fiscal deficit, of course, and our debt uh, has, uh, you know, increased. We depend a lot uh, on remittances uh, for Ugandans who are in the diaspora, uh, who largely, you know, in Europe and the and the, the United States and the parts of you know uh, Middle East and Asia. That has practically gone down. Monthly, we we receive uh, about fifteen million US dollars from this, uh, so over a billion dollars annually, over a billion dollars, actually close to $2 billion annually comes as a remittances for Ugandans, you know, living abroad. Now, because of the impact of COVID, that has practically dried. In the recent past, we have been depending a lot on tourism uh, uh, as one of the big foreign exchange earners. Uh, of course, as you know, uh, because of the local measures, practically there has not been any tourists, of course, coming, moving around anyway. Uh, so that you know, source of uh, revenue has also gone down, and actually, to make it worse, uh, our it has also had a very big impact on poverty, on the poverty numbers. We have been systematically reducing poverty over the years. At some point in the nineties, our poverty levels were close to sixty percent of the population. So sixty percent of the population we are living below the poverty line at some point. And we had progressively reduced this number to below 20%. Now, on account of the COVID impact, our projection is that uh, by the end of this year, our poverty levels would have increased to 25% of the population. So a quarter of the population would actually be living below the poverty line. And in, 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 the nominal, in absolute numbers, that's about 2 million, additional 2 million people would actually be Go in, uh, the impact of COVID has definitely been extremely uh, uh, harsh. So in terms of uh, uh, why, how the, we have used the inf information, uh, the openness of the budget. Uh, number one, because we have been implementing an, a, a, you know, a transparent budget system, it has, been, it has become easy. Because right from the beginning, we engaged the uh, uh, various partners, okay, uh, to raise, you know, funding for COVID interventions. Our government actually set up even a national task force comprised largely of the private sector to be able to raise the resources for COVID interventions. Now, because we have been having this, you know, transparent system, I think that was able to send a very strong message to the population that already this information is actually available for the public, you know, in terms of uh, scrutiny, but also in terms of uh, uh, how these resources, you know, are, are actually used. So the population is already, because the population is already uh, privy to this information, it has proved very, very crucial uh, in terms of providing that kind of confidence uh, to the population, both in terms of the population themselves contributing to the COVID interventions, but also in terms of uh, following up how the government resources themselves are actually being, you know, used. Uh, uh, both in terms of the, the specific interventions that government is undertaking, but also uh, to track, you know, uh, where these resources actually are ending up. So that has been extremely important, and I think that is largely because uh, we have had the, uh, an open budget system uh, for many years, uh, as I said. I think uh, maybe the, the other point I would want to make is. Uh, uh, that uh, the fact that uh, we have uh, uh, information available to the pub to the public, it has also become easy uh, for the legislature, for you know, for Parliament, uh, you know, to understand. Because, like, uh, I think one of the presenters did, did mention the fact that uh, many of the countries have had to change our budgets. Uh, we 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 normally do 
our financial year runs from June happened in March. And our new financial year, which we are in now, uh, the budget was approved in May. So in effect, by the time the budget was approved, we had not fully assessed uh, the impact of COVID. So come the new financial year, we have actually had to essentially you know, turn around the entire budget of the current financial year to ensure that we focus on those areas which are uh, addressing the impact of COVID. And here we are looking at uh, the economic impact because we try to stimulate the businesses uh, because we need the uh, you know incomes in the pockets of the of the population, uh, and of course as much as we need the revenue, but also addressing the health impact. Now that can has the, the openness of the budget has helped us in the sense that the uh, parliament of course uh, appreciates the fact of where we, these resources are going because at the end of the day we have to report uh, to to parliament as uh, uh, the legislative arm of the government, and of course by implication. I believe this will also help uh, the audit authorities uh, when it comes to auditing uh, these resources. Maybe I should conclude by saying that uh, uh, we have also had a lot of support uh, from the partners. And I believe this again has been because of uh, the openness of our budget and the fact that we have information which is readily available. So it has been easier for us you know, to demonstrate to the partners you know, yes, the amount of resources, because they actually know, you know, where these resources are allocated. And of course, arising out of the impact of COVID, it has been able uh, for us to convince the partners to give us additional resources. And actually, the resources they have given us, as I said, are not just for health interventions, because I, we have looked at the COVID situation as an economy-wide, you know, challenge, not just uh, a health challenge. So why we continuously, you know, make a case for getting money for you know the health interventions but we're also mindful of the fact that uh, it is actually impacting uh, on the livelihood of the population uh, much much uh, probably actually more than uh, it does on the direct uh, impact on health uh, do i still have time no i think uh, we can we can <laughs> leave it here um thank you for okay, sharing that. thank you thank, thank you very much no, thank you for sharing um, some uh, specific inputs in terms of how budget transparency is helping the government of uh, Uganda and the Ministry of Finance to respond uh, to the to the pandemic uh, challenges. And now we will turn uh, to Mary um, uh, to share some uh, inputs and insights from the perspective of uh, civil society in um, uh, Nigeria. Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Appan. I'm the national president of the Small Scale Women Farmers Organization in Nigeria. And that is so fun. I'm going to be sharing the experience of Small Scale Women Farmers Organization in Nigeria. I want to briefly give an overview of uh, so fun. Uh, so fun is uh, an association of over 500,000 small scale women farmers in Nigeria. And we are so fond, we are calling for equitable access to agricultural land, access to input, seed, gender friendly equipment, fertilizer, and herbicides. And in that, we are working to address. Um, the SDG goal number two, we talk about the zero hunger. And in fact, if there's zero hunger, we know that actually there's going to be um, good health and uh, well being. And that is addressing SDG number three. And if people are living in good health, we are going to have quality education. and. We're also calling for peace and justice. And also, uh, we're also addressing uh, gender equality and women empowerment. Um, the open budget and achieving the SDG goal, the development outcomes in agri sector, health, water and education cannot be achieved without the sustainable investment. And that is what we have actually been uh, working on, on public finance management. 
at the heart of achieving the SDG uh, goals. In Nigeria, uh, for the past years, investment uh, to the critical sector has yielded little returns. This is strongly linked to actually weak accountability, transparency, and citizen participation. In the agri sector, for instance, uh, in the decades of public spending in the sector has not improved the life of uh, small holder farmers, especially uh, women. We've not been having access to the agricultural land and vital input, and also uh, gender-friendly equipment, which addresses SDG number uh, three. And also, uh, SDG number 16. Mm -hmm. And in the agri sector, for uh, instance, um, we have actually been looking at government spending in these areas. And this has limited productivity and slowed gain made toward achieving the zero hunger by 2030 as specified in the SDG 2. Um, the government at the national and subnational level have not adequately engaged the involvement of smallholder farmers uh, to prioritize and address their needs. Uh, small scale farmers, uh, most of the time in the budget preparation are not consulted adequately in fiscal government decision making. And the space for this sector is actually very limited. During the COVID-19 pandemic, for instance, the government reversed the budget without citizen input and consultation. Uh, the 2020 budget was revised between the executive and the legislature, totally excluding the citizen input. We tried as much as possible to make sure that we have a space. We actually engage, speak with the government, paid advocacy visit on the need for um, a smallholder farmers to actually be part of this revised budget. And we also advise that the budget for other sectors can be reviewed, but that of agri should remain as it is. But actually our comment were not taken into consideration. There was also generally insufficient information and little transparency around the management of critical funds mapped out for emergency response during the pandemic. We expected that at least uh, during the farming season, farmers will be given their own palliative in form of input to be able to go back to the farm and also increase production to feed the mass growing population in the country. Uh, so Fon believes that it will be difficult to achieve the SDG under these conditions, except government takes effort to listen to citizen and transparent accountability. Now, the role of civil society in strengthening the budget in COVID-19 context, I want to say that um, the COVID-19 forced government to respond differently. In most cases, the space for citizen engagement have further uh, actually reduced weakening accountability effort. Well, the civil society groups may have little influence over the critical physical decision made unilaterally by the government. They can monitor public spending. We can actually monitor public spending in different sectors. And more especially as uh, so far, 
we monitor public spending in the agri sector. Uh, it is also the role of the civil society to continue to ask critical questions around government spending and demand accountability. Social accountability tools like social audit, community scorecards can be useful tools in holding government accountable. And that is what we have actually been using, you know, to know what government has been doing at different level tiers of government. Um, in, in going forward, how to strengthen oversight to support the SDG implementation, we are looking at the expert CSOs can actually leverage partnership with grassroots movement, like our own movement, which is a grassroots movement and community-based group to monitor government spending within their communities. Uh, if government is saying they have allocated a certain amount of money and this is where the project has taken place, people within the community can be able to provide useful information. And that is what we have been doing within the community to track the government expenditure in the agri sector. And strengthening networking among civil society groups to ensure that budget expenditure tracking is coordinated. Collective action can help build countervailing powers. And if we actually come together and we are doing the same work, it will help to put government on track to be able to make sure that the money release is actually spent for what is released. Now, uh, another point is that civil society groups should also build strong relationship with the legislators and the auditor general to strengthen their oversight responsibility. Now, most of these um, legislatures actually, you know, carry out projects within their constituencies. And, you know, it, it is the oversight function that will actually look at whether actually those activities were actually carried out or not. And if this is, if we have a very strong relationship with them, we can be able to give them information of what is actually uh, translated on ground based on what they have uh, voted for. We have also a virtual accountability platform should be explored. This will actually put uh, a lot of things on track. Uh, we look at media to be a very strong tool to amplify voices. Civil society can exploit partnership with the media to amplify accountability initiatives and exert pressure on government. As a platform show fund, we actually engage with, um, we have a women radio in Nigeria, uh, which actually just speaks of women issue. And in this women radio, Shofan have an opportunity of speaking uh, on the issues on the agri sector that affects Shofan. And we have actually been able to have figures of budget releases, figures of budget for uh, agri sector. And we go on the radio to, you know, to talk to citizens. This is what the government have actually allocated for this activity. So we want individuals, associations, states, local government to actually track this. They can even go to, you know, to the budget office to demand for the budget to actually identify what was actually allocated. And this women radio have helped us to amplify our issues as women farmers. It has actually been a very, very good tool. At the national, we have uh, the KISS FM radio which is also once in a week they allow women, especially if it's a farmer's section where they allow women to come and speak on their issues. And we actually have a very, very good opportunity um, to speak on the issues of uh, women farmers and also to speak on the issues um, that actually affect the smallholder farmers. We speak on the issues of the budget, especially um, the budget for the, the reviewed budget for the pandemic uh, in this 2020, we speak through the media to talk to government on the need of not to slash the budget for the agri sector. 
as this is the only critical sector that will sustain the country amidst this pandemic. Since the price of oil fall down, we need to strengthen this sector in order for the country to come out of what we have entered. And also, we are also looking at- uh, Mary, Mary, sorry yes. to interrupt. Um, if you can uh, wrap up your uh, intervention because we need to uh, give some time for the discussions and then to have some time for questions. Uh, very good. I, I would love to say that um, uh, actually what we are doing as a, a chauffeur at the national level and the subnational level, uh, we have some ad uh, uh, adequately engaged with farmers to prioritize our needs and the women farmers you know, are actually engaging with government, especially now that the government is planning to prepare the 2021 budget. We are actually engaging to make sure that our issues are actually being captured. Um, uh, there's also a generally insufficient information around the transparency of the budget. Actually, we are trying to see how we can also involve um, working close with the civil society to actually analyze the budget for 2021 and the releases for us to be able to have the accurate figure for us to be able to engage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, I would like now to invite our discussants, uh, Katarina and Oliver, to share uh, some inputs. Katarina, um, five minutes uh, to share some inputs uh, in terms of the importance of um, uh, budget transparency to support SDG implementation and also uh, the, the, a better governance of the responses to the pandemic. Uh, okay, uh, government accountability, fiscal budget transparency and public participation are topic I've been researching for ages and now COVID only emphasized this interest. We all know uh, that for governments, pandemic means decreased revenue and increased expenditure, but for citizens, it might mean life or death. Uh, drastic changes in access to health, jobs, education, welfare, security, etc. Governments are undertaking emergency measures, which affect efficiency and equity of both revenue and expenditure, and consequently, well-being of citizens particularly of those marginalized and excluded. Uh, it means that all government decisions, information and data should be fully transparent to all parts of governments, parliaments, oversight institutions and general public. As only the full disclosure enables control of these measures and of their impact on SDGs. Thanks to GIFT and IBP, Institute of Public Finance, where I'm working, is trying to support Croatian Ministry of Finance efforts to transparently publish the COVID responses and recovery related data. And what we noticed that worked well in Croatia, everything is online. Online detailed explanations of most emergency measures online quick application, for example, for tax reliefs, for job preservation measures, and uh, online release of beneficiaries of these measures. Uh, that worked well. And what would we recommend to others is to use GIFT's fiscal data for emergency response guide for COVID and GIFT support in these matters to identify, consolidate, and publish data required to achieve greater transparency of emergency responses, for example, on tax reliefs measures and tax deferrals, to provide relevant, timely, and understandable data, to target data for different users, because uh, different uh, audiences need different data, and to develop one central place for disclosing fiscal information. Uh, there are still some open issues. First of all, how to motivate everyone. Executive to be more transparent even in normal times, and now particularly members of parliaments to more actively participate in budget processes, particularly to act upon size reports. 
media to educate themselves and citizens to use published data. As the year 2030 is just around the corner, we need immediate subnational, national, and international political will for full fiscal budgetary disclosure, particularly of measures and policies relevant for marginalized and excluded citizens. That's briefly what I wanted to say, and I can, in discussion, add something further. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Um, I would like to invite now uh, Oliver to share um, some input in uh, five minutes. Oliver. Thank you so much, Arantxa. Um, I, I can speak briefly to the, the broader fiscal impact of the COVID shock, uh, the necessary response and how open budgets could be helpful or supportive in this context. Um, Jesus has already mentioned some figures uh, about this uh, macro and fiscal impact, but I think it's worth reiterating just how large that shock is that the world is experiencing right now. I, I, I've pulled out the IMF estimates, which, which are mm -hmm. based on their you know, um, projection for the global econ economic recovery, which I think uh, even by their own admission on the optimistic side. So we are assuming that the, economy, the global economy recovers well or quickly by 2021. And still we expect the average fiscal deficit to increase from around 80% of GDP to over 100% of GDP globally. So that's you know, really a massive increase in, in, in public debt and, and, and fiscal deficits. Um, and the second issue there to note, and that's also something Jesus has already mentioned, is that that, uh, that fiscal shock and the fiscal response is extremely uneven across countries. We, we can observe increases in deficits across all countries. That's because of the plunge in revenue and the immediate spending needs. But the fiscal response, the discretionary spending is extremely uneven. Developed countries that have fiscal space have responded with very, very large um, fiscal packages from 10 to 20% of GDP. In low-income countries, on average, this uh, discretionary response is much, much smaller, around the one percentage point of GDP. Um, that's a problem in its own right, and it's a reflection of the much smaller fiscal space that these countries have. And that's extremely concerning when you think about the, the, the the, the economic, the social fallout of the crisis and, and the very uh, restrained response that's, that comes from the um, budget and debt concerns in, in many low-income countries. Now, what, what is to be done about this or what should the response be? I think there's a, a consensus uh, that there's a need for a, a fiscal response that's medium-term oriented, so that's um, you know, gives adequate thoughts to the medium term implications that both protects and increases investment in SDG priorities. You can think of public investments and social expenditure first, but there are a range of other priorities. Those we would want to protect. And at the same time, of course, there's a need to maintain or preserve fiscal and debt sustainability over the medium term. I think those are the twin objectives that we are aiming for. And the question is how to achieve that in this extremely challenging context and what, what can we take from the discussion around open budgets in this effort. And I, I thought there are a couple of issues to highlight. One, of course, is that the challenge is very different depending on the fiscal space in countries. So in many developed countries, I think there is no immediate uh, fiscal constraint and there's a, a strong case to be made to, to borrow, to not retrench too quickly, and to make sure that those recovery packages are well aligned with development priorities. Um, I, it's, it's very early to assess that, of course, because in the immediate crisis response, the focus is rightly on health expenditure, on, on support for firms and households. But I think there are some indications that at least in some major economies, there is a, a, a re, there's the potential for a very strong focus of those recovery um, plans, for example, on, on climate related expenditure. So that's, and it's an opportunity that in a way we, we cannot afford to waste. Um, so it's extremely important that those large recovery packages are well aligned with our global priorities, be that the SDGs, be that the climate, um, climate targets. 
And I think open, the open budgets can obviously contribute to it. In a way, it's, it, this is about how well those recovery plans reflect citizen priorities as expressed in our global ambitions, right? So, so that's something to watch out for and, and to make sure that we use the, the tools that we have here to ensure that that's the case. Now, when you come to countries that are more uh, constrained, the, the challenge is, is, is slightly different. The question there is how to do that while at the same time maintain that sustainability, avoid that crisis. Now, that's not something that many countries will be able to do on their own. So there's a clear case and need for international support. We've had lots of discussions at the UN over the summer over what such support could look like. There's, of course, the G20 initiative around debt service suspension, etc. cetera. Um, so that, but that's what's been happening so far is not enough. So we already see, I think we had another case yesterday of a country asking for um, uh, at least initiating a restructuring of debt. So there's a clear need for more international support. At the same time, at the national level, I think that um, this current crisis has revealed some challenges around, for example, transparency around debt, right? So um, the, the, the question of transparency around borrowing, more better understanding of existing liabilities, the terms of debt, contingent liabilities, etc. It would have helped to maybe preempt some of the problems we have right now, and this that should definitely be a priority going forward to make sure that in the effort to build back better, we also can work towards better preventing that crisis in the future. Um, one last point I wanted to add, and maybe that's something for the discussion also, as we look towards you know, these medium term efforts for fiscal sustainability and financing the SDGs, there's one initiative in the UN that's been taken up in a lot of countries around integrated financing frameworks. That's a concept that comes out of Addis that tries to help countries better align their financing policies, their budgets with, but also you know, private financing policies with their national medium-term priorities with the SDGs. There's a lot of work going on. There are around, there are, I think, 16 pioneer countries, but many other countries are thinking about this concept. And I, I wanted to mention it here because as we, as we think about it, issues around transparency, inclusive governance, discussions with stakeholders are extremely integral to that concept. So it's really built into this idea of integrated financing approaches that there needs to be consultations with relevant stakeholders, inclusive governance, there needs to be uh, transparency, accountability, monitoring and review built into these integrated approaches. So that's something that we are working on. And I, I believe many of my fellow panelists and many audience members would be natural allies in this work. And I think that's a conversation we should continue to see how we can bring these discussions together. Thank you, uh, Oliver. Um, I would like now to open for some questions and discussion. Uh, we have a few questions um, from participants in the chat. There was some specific request for the website that Kenneth mentioned uh, from Uganda. I think that link has already been shared in the, in the, in the chat box. Um, there was one question which I would like to um, ask uh, both to Jesus and and Elena, uh, based on Elena's presentation, you saw that there is a gap between legislative oversight and um, oversight by supreme audit institutions, that uh, when legislative oversight is strong, not always the supreme audit institution um, is uh, uh, doing a strong oversight and the other way around. So it, there seems to be some gap in terms of both kind of oversight not being aligned or um, uh, in, in the same countries. Uh, so there was some question um, regarding what are the factors uh, that can explain this gap between legislative and audit oversight is it that parliaments do not use the report, the material produced by supreme audit institutions? Um, what are the factors that can explain this, um, this difference between the strength of legislative oversight and uh, the external audit oversight? Uh, Jesus? Sí, eh, gracias, Arancha. Eh, tiene razón, eh, Elena, existe ese. 
y tiene que ver con, me parece a mí, el dispositivo institucional de, de, de nuestra región de América Latina, eh, que es esencialmente presidencialista. Eh, y eso revela o indica también otro dato de la realidad, que es la debilidad relativa del Congreso en términos de recursos institucionales en relación al Poder Ejecutivo, al, a la administración. Eh, al mismo tiempo, las debilidades del funcionamiento del sistema político en nuestra región de América Latina contribuye a eso. Y lo complejiza cuando hay que mirar si el país es unitario o federal, si es unicameral o bicameral. Así que creo que ese son el conjunto de cuestiones que hacen, que contribuyen a entender el porqué de ese gap que señalaba Elena. Tal vez me gustaría decir que esta debilidad del funcionamiento del dispositivo de control no solo tiene que ver con el presupuesto. Yo creo que uno de los problemas grandes que tenemos en la región en el funcionamiento de las entidades fiscalizadoras superiores es el follow-up. ¿Cómo sigue luego que la entidad fiscalizadora superior hizo su dictamen, su auditoría? Nosotros en Argentina estamos intentando involucrar a las organizaciones de la sociedad civil para que hagan el seguimiento de las hallazgos, observaciones y recomendaciones que hace la entidad fiscalizadora superior porque tienen condiciones de acceso, básicamente aquellas con intereses temáticos, a hacer el seguimiento, el control del cumplimiento de las recomendaciones. Gracias, Jesús. Uh, Elena, could you share some inputs maybe based on IDP research and the results of the, of the survey? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Was, yeah. Um, maybe just uh, what well, we observed it, we observed it from the indicators that we had in the survey. And I think what um, Jesus said applies also globally. So in, in the sense that in, in, in more cases than not, during the budget execution process, for example, the executive had the freedom to make changes to the budget, to, to budget lines and, and, and making shifts and changes, deal with additional resources without getting parliamentary approval, for example. Uh, or, or when a supplementary budget is you know, drafted, then, then in some cases the process to approve it, the process to, to pass expenditures doesn't have to go through legislative approval first, but they first spend and then get ratification. So, so, so in that sense, um, that, that, that partially re reflects the, the, the lower score in, in legislative oversight. Um, another could be the fact that the, the, the discussion in Parliament for around the budget process, the, the budget proposal is either very short or is not happening at all. And so the, the actual opportunity for the Parliament to influence the budget and make decisions around it is, is more limited. Um, so that, that's, that's what we observed, which I think is in line with what um, Jesus mentioned as well. Thank you, um, Elena. I would like now to uh, maybe uh, for both uh, Katarina and, and Oliver, uh, we have seen uh, based on the results uh, presented by Elena and also Oliver referred to this and, and Katarina that there are challenges still in terms of uh, uh, budget transparency, although we seem to be kind of regaining momentum after um, a drop in the, in the previous survey, but there are also challenges regarding transparency of debt, as uh, Oliver mentioned. There are uh, challenges in terms also of the participatory mechanisms. Um, so one of the, of, the, of the questions that I think uh, Katarina presented is how to create incentives uh, to increase uh, this transparency and participation in the budget process. Um, so some inputs in terms of how we can create these incentives for different actors to work together, what role can uh, different stakeholders play uh, to create these incentives and maybe to consider these issues of transparency and accountability in these medium term integrated frameworks that Oliver uh, mentioned. Uh, maybe based on the experience of some of the countries uh, which are piloting this kind of approach. 
some inputs, Katarina, Oliver. Okay, I can say something. Um, I don't know uh, when we were speaking about uh, the open budget survey, I thought that one could probably look at examples of countries uh, like Bangladesh, UK, South Africa, Pakistan, etc., cetera, uh, which are offering, for example, detailed breakdowns of pro-poor expenditures, policy priorities, expected outputs, estimates of past and future spending for poverty alleviation, uh, financial and performance info of anti-poverty schemes, or providing redistributional effects by gender, by households. Or we can look at New Zealand's well-being budget 2020, rebuilding together. Uh, we at the Institute of Public Finance also would offer numerous suggestions for improving, uh, for example, budget transparency at local government levels, uh, which is really necessary for greater public participation, which might lead to greater uh, government accountability. I think there are so many, so many examples around the world how some countries, not always the richest and the biggest, are uh, trying to improve it, that one could look at them. Uh, however, as I always emphasize, uh, what we need most is the political will, international first of all, the national and subnational, to really include all members of society in achieving SDGs. We don't have time now to speak about the problem of uh, migrants, uh, of problems uh, on the borders of Europe, etc. Uh, but problems are really huge. And without inclusion and participation of all uh, members of societies, it would be, they would be difficult to solve even without COVID. And with COVID, it's all even worse. Thank you. If I can come in on the, yeah. tr on the debt side. So I, I think one could think about the two, the two main actors in the debt transaction, right? The creditors and the debtors. And I think on both sides, there can be they can there can be incentives to be less than fully transparent and the question is what can one do on both sides on the data side the one thing that comes to mind is indeed to strengthen overall to strengthen the role of those actors at the national level that do have a genuine interest in more transparency in understanding the long-term obligations and what the long-term impacts of such obligations can be rather than those actors that may have more short-term incentives, you know, to tide over <laughs> until the next election cycle. So that would include, of course, parliaments, but other actors as well. And I think generally there is a case to be made to try to strengthen the links between such financing decisions and the long-term objectives. On the creditor side, I think one interesting question indeed is, is thinking about some of the principles that are really widely shared and agreed around what um, sustainable and responsible lending looks like. And I think there are very few people who would disagree with some of those principles. So the question really is how do we create stronger incentives for lenders to adhere to those as well? There are some, I mean, the first step would be to monitor those more effectively, right? We have those principles, they are often universally agreed, but they are not very effectively monitored. So creditors that don't um, adhere to them, we, we don't even know, you know, uh, about many of, of them and how well they, are, they adhere to these principles. So better monitoring of such principles. But then you can also think of creating financial incentives, right? Debt that, that, is, that is provided or credits that are provided without adhering to some of those principles may be considered junior to other um, more, more transparently procured debts. So you could think of building legal incentives, et cetera, to, to, to disincentivize um, such lending behavior. I think we are quite far from that second step, but at a minimum, I think we should work towards better monitoring um, 
the, the transparency of lenders as well. Thank you, Oliver. Um, one question for, for Elena. We have been uh, discussing about the importance of aligning um, the financing frameworks, the budget processes, fiscal measures with long-term objectives. I know that IBP has been doing some research on one of the cases that Katarina mentioned, which is uh, New Zealand. Um, could you maybe share some insights uh, uh, regarding this, uh, this example and, um, and more generally elaborate on the importance of this long-term alignment uh, um, based on, on the research that IBP has done? So, um, the, the, the case that, that Katarina mentioned or that you've, meant, you've been alluding to is, is the well-being budget in, in New Zealand. Um, I would say that it's probably a bit early to see the results of it because they, they just have done it. So, so, but what, what happened was also the process to, to set it up, it's, it's, which, which was interesting and, and participatory. And so what this case highlights is not only the importance of connecting the budget with um, certain indicators around well-being, but it's also around, and, and therefore having a budget that is better targeting um, the needs of the people, um, but it's also about the process, which is about how do you get to that, right? So how do you build a budget that is more responsive to, uh, to the people? And, and, and so the case study that we have highlighted in the, in the survey report, the 2019 Open Budget Survey report, highlights also the, the process that this, the government followed to, to collect citizens' priorities and ideas and comments about it. So they had a fairly lengthy and, and not so easy process to, to collect that input that then fed into the indicators that were part of the well-being budget that, that were then used to draft the well-being budget. So I would say that, um, yeah, the, 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 the importance of connecting budgets with people's needs is, is essential. We have some ideas on how to do that through, for example, New Zealand, which is, which is great. Um, knowing that there are gonna be challenges, it hasn't been easy in New Zealand, and so I'm sure that it, it, it's not an easy process per se, but it is um, needed and, and also possible. And I think given the, growing number of civil society organizations that are involved in these issues and, 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 and are both working on sector specific issues, SDGs specific issues, but also more and more knowledgeable about the budget. I think this, this is, is more and more, uh, yeah, more likely to happen. Thank you, Elena. Um, I would like to, before we close, I would like to do a last round, uh, one specific question for all our panelists, and I will start with uh, Mary. Um, in terms of one, two very specific recommendations, um, in terms of actions, ideas uh, that we could um, uh, advance going forward in order to strengthen um, budget uh, transparency and accountability, considering also the context uh, which uh, we are uh, going through with the pandemic, uh, and considering also the national situation in some cases like Argentina or uh, Nigeria. So Mary, if you want to start, very uh, concrete uh, idea, action, recommendation uh, that you want to um, leave the audience with information about the budget. Gage, you know, uh, in meeting uh, actually the SDG goals as we are talking about, like in Nigeria we have been advocating that there should be an increase in the budget. And if there is an open budget, it means the budget is for the citizens. So the citizens should be part of the budget um, uh, formulation at the beginning. And also there should also be access to information. You know, Lack of formal participatory mechanism has actually, you know, led the uh, citizens to, to lack information of what actually the budget is. And working with an organization like IBP, we have seen it in the five states where IBP is working in Nigeria. You know, capacity have been built, women have actually been engaged. And in those states, we could see that the, 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 the governors and the state ministries of agriculture in those states are involving women actively and the citizen in the budget participation. And I think this needs to be replicated in other states also for us to be able to make to move forward. We are seeing a very active result where IBP is working in terms of budget 
uh, transparency and accountability. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mary. Uh, Jesús, uh, una recomendación, un, alguna idea, iniciativa, acción específica eh, para, para el, el, el futuro inmediato. En aquellos lugares donde no haya, construir, crear una oficina de presupuesto en el Congreso. Eso es un eh, recurso institucional indispensable, sobre todo teniendo en cuenta esa asimetría de recursos que existen entre el Ejecutivo y el Legislativo, y teniendo en cuenta que en nuestra región la diversidad de opiniones está en el Congreso, y el Ejecutivo no necesariamente toma en cuenta esa diversidad de opiniones y puntos de vista. Gracias, Jesús. Catarina, one or, or two specific uh, recommendations, actions, ideas. Catarina? Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, got, I got you distracted. <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, listening at Jesus uh, because I think it was a great uh, topic, um, a great point to make about the capacity of parliaments, which is uh, the problem in numerous countries. What I would say, what I always say is that subnational and national governments simply have to identify, consolidate and publish data which are relevant and timely understandable to all types of targeted users uh, with narrative explanations for all the data and policies, particularly of the impact of funds for policies intended to benefit the most impoverished and outcomes of these policies, because we are today speaking about SDGs. Uh, governments should legally prescribe who has to publish what, when, and establish penalties for non-publication, and they have to establish mechanisms for public participation. Internationals should lead providing the instru instructions and help. I already mentioned, for example, gifts guide, but there is also IMF, OECD, numerous instructions, but they should be implemented. Again, political will is essential. That's all. Thank you, Katarina. Oliver? Um, thank you, yeah. Um, maybe less specifically focused on transparency, but slightly broader. I think there'll be quite a few countries in the coming weeks and months that, uh, I mean, all countries will have to do a reset on their on, fine, on how to finance their development strategies since the baseline has shifted so dramatically. In, in quite a few countries that might happen in a quite structured way if they do need um, debt relief or debt restructurings and there is thinking ongoing international community. And I think that is in a way also an opportunity to think about integrated financing strategies that are linked to medium term development priorities so that we really avoid thinking about fiscal sustainability separated from our other uh, longer term development goals. I think there is a sensibility to that, that this, this, any such restructuring packages would have to come with, with integrated approaches, looking at all sources of financing to make sure that those development priorities can be maintained and achieved. But that's, it's, I think it's an opportunity to adopt such approaches and, and to insist that they cannot come that fiscal cons you know, considerations cannot come at the expense of development priorities. Thank you, Oliver. Elena? A lot of this I would have probably said myself, um, but, but uh, to, I guess to summarize, I would say use what's already there in the sense that there are portals, there, there are websites. So in terms of publishing information, let's, let's do that. Um, let's do it, let's publish more disaggregated information because that is most useful. And so using what's already there, let's do more. Um, and, then, and then the other um, would be to listen to one another. And this might sound philosophical, but the idea is really to, you know, we know that there are civil society groups that are doing excellent work and useful work let's make sure that they connect with the governments that uh, are 
I think, welcoming and in need of, of, the, of some extra support, especially in these times. And so uh, let's not reinvent the wheel and use what's already there, resources, websites, as Katerina also mentioned, extra resources, and, and to connect. Um, let's connect as, as different stakeholders to support one another. Thank you, Elena. Uh, we have lost Kenneth, so that's uh, why I will not ask him for some specific recommendations, but I hope he will be able to serve some uh, with, uh, with us. Um, I think we have had a very interesting discussion. We have acknowledged that we are living um, through really challenging times, that the shock of the pandemic uh, has been uh, significant, is being significant um, in uh, economies, societies uh, uh, across the world. Um, the responses, as we have seen, have been very unequal, and we need also tailored measures uh, considering the different capacities, uh, the different time horizons, um, uh, the different realities in different, in different countries. I think we have um, all agreed that um, uh, longer term development priorities and uh, citizens' lives need to be put at the center of these discussions regarding uh, financing, regarding debt, regarding uh, budget processes, um, regarding fiscal measures. And as uh, Katarina and Elena have emphasized, uh, there are resources out there. There are examples of countries doing interesting things, and we can learn from these processes and from the steps that they have been taken. Um, so I would like to thank all uh, our speakers and discussants uh, for their inputs, for their participation. Um, we really uh, look forward to continuing this conversation, maybe in other sessions and in other, in other venues. And I would like to thank also all the participants um, in, in the webinar, all the audience for joining uh, with us uh, today.